Hi, I'm Mimi Gerges. U.S. immigration agents went undercover to catch the man behind the largest human smuggling operation in history. And the immigrants pouring into the country aren't Mexicans, they're South Asians. As an American, I took things for granted. We grew up in a sense that we have a great country, and until you've been in the back of a U-Haul or crossing the river where you almost drown, you realize what people go through to come into the country. Welcome to the Mimi Gerges Show. About 20 years ago, what was then called the INS, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, found out about a huge international human smuggling operation bringing mostly South Asians to the U.S. At the center of it all was this guy named Man Singh. He would smuggle people illegally across the world into the United States and then to various cities around the country, charging an estimated $30,000 per person. And he frankly didn't care what they were trying to do once they got here get a job or be a terrorist, as long as they paid up. So the Justice Department authorized Border Patrol agents to go undercover to try to catch this guy. Ippolito Acosta ran the operation, and he wrote about it, along with fellow agent A.J. Irwin, in a book called The Hunt for Man Singh. Poli, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So how big a deal was this guy, Man Singh? Well, it was a huge deal. Uh, number one, he had been operating for many, many years. Uh, and one of the very unique things about this was that Mansingh was not in the United States. He was several thousand miles away from our border, but he was a major target. He was the head of the organization. He had been doing it for years. He was very successful. And one of the things that you just mentioned that was very important, he didn't care what the people were coming into the country for. Many, many were coming in to make a, uh, a better way of life, to feed their families, but no one knows that every single individual was doing that. Uh, so there was a, a lot of uh, different things, very unique, and he was based in South America. Niranjan Mansingh was not a uh, Hispanic, a, a Latin smuggler. He was actually a British citizen. Uh, that from who, India. From India, who had been born in India. And the people that he was bringing over, mostly Indians? There was uh, Indians, uh, Pakistanis, uh, Syrians, uh, anybody who was willing to pay the $25,000, $35,000 that it took to get to the United States. So like how much money was he making? Well, the, it's hard to say exactly how much money he was making himself, but when you figure that at any one time they could have 100 or 200 people in the pipeline, because remember that the people were coming in from Southeast Asia, you, you had people uh, along the way coming through Russia, through Cuba, through the Bahamas, uh, 200 people at any one time. If you multiply those figures, it gives you an idea that was a huge business. This operation took place in the late 90s, but what kind of human smuggling is happening now? Human smuggling continues uh, to what it was ba back then. We had the same type of human smuggling. People are still trying to come into the country. We have tightened our security uh, along the U.S.-Mexico uh, border, but people are still coming in. People are still being successful. We have the same type of activity ongoing right now. So can you give me some numbers, like how many people are, are coming in illegally? Well, you know, when you look at the, uh, the, the figures uh, from 2014 showed that the uh, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement or the, their, their deportation branch or the Border Patrol actually returned 300 to 347,000 people that were uh, expelled from the country that were many of them that were caught entering along the border. So you know that they're still coming in in large numbers, Mimi. The cases you were working on, people were coming in voluntarily, right? This was not a case cases of human trafficking. Th that's correct, but l l let's also understand one thing. When people are paying twenty-five, thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars to come to the United States, where are they going? How are they going to pay that money back? So there's a very a, a likelihood that people can be placed in that particular position. The initial intent might have been to come into the country to work, but work at what? How do you pay that off? And Especially because you don't have status, exactly. so you can't work legally anyway. That, that's correct. And, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, also important to note, when you travel to places like uh, New York, Chicago, some of those places, people working at convenience stores that are paying off those, uh, those fees, are they there because they want to be, or do they have to be there because they have to pay off the smuggling fees? So let's go through kind of how he and other smugglers got people from point A to, to the United States. Okay. Well, you know what? One of the uh, one of the things that we talk about, uh, Man Singh, he'd been in business for about 20 years when we actually started uh, working on the hunt for Man Singh. 
Uh, he had actually been on a boatload of almost 200 immigrants that were coming into Canada that were arrested uh, by, by Canadian authorities. But Man Singh was able to, in one of the rare cases where he was actually with the group, he was able to pass himself off as one of the people being smuggled into the country. So consequently, he was released, moved for his operations, ultimately went into Belize, uh, where he continued his operations and worked throughout South America, Central America, ultimately set up his operations in Ecuador. However, we also had what we had in this operation, the Hawala laundering system, because there's, you have to set up a scheme on how you pay the smuggling fees. How are those uh, monies distributed? Uh, Man Singh uh, had people in the United States who would collect the fees. They would make sure that it was laundered or got back to the, to the uh, Mem other members of the organization that were ru running the finances, and Man Singh directed the operation from his uh, location in Quito, Ecuador. So let's say somebody in somewhere in India wants to come to the United States, he contacts some smuggler there, he flies to South America, somewhere in South America then? And then from there, is it overland? Like, what's, what's the route? The, uh, they had different routes, but I think that one of the things that uh, you'll find that People would, you have brokers in the United States and you have brokers in India, Pakistan, and some of those other countries, uh, again, developed over a period of years. So you have people that leave, uh, let, let's say Pakistan or India, travel into Russia. From Russia, they would travel into Cuba. Uh, from Cuba, they would travel into the Bahamas or they would travel into uh, Ecuador or Guatemala or Panama. Uh, some of those countries were selected because there's corruption in those countries. It's easy to get access to, the, to some of the countries like uh, uh, Ecuador. And that was the reason that Man Singh set up his last operation in Ecuador because of the lax immigration entry requirements uh, of the government of Ecuador. And you mentioned corruption, so he could just pay off the police. He could pay off the people at the airport. That's and they would just let people go on in. Well, for the most part, in many cases, they were in on the scheme with, uh, with Man Singh, as they have been with other, other smugglers as well. All right, so let's talk about the operation, the, the undercover operation. How was it set up, and what, what was the purpose was to, to find him, to catch him, to get information about him, what? Well, interestingly enough, uh, Man Singh had been operating for years before we actually had a coordinated investigation on him. But what, what, what had happened was that uh, one of his uh, subordinates was a pilot uh, that was actually smuggling people from the South Texas border uh, into Dallas, into Oklahoma, and then they would be distributed to other parts of the country. Ironically, this pilot was building up his flying time so he could later on become a commercial pilot. Uh, so he found a way to get paid, uh, smuggle people into the country, ultimately realized that uh, he was making less money than some of the other smugglers, so he continued the operation and uh, he attempted to jump over some of the people that he was working with and ultimately met with Man Singh in uh, Quito, Ecuador. This pilot became part of our investigation. He was arrested. Uh, he started giving us information. And uh, he always knew that he was doing something illegal, right? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, there, there's, no, there's no doubt. He, he, knew exactly that, uh, he knew exactly what he was doing, but his purpose at that time was built up his flying time, and when he found out that he could make money at the same make time. Make good money. Make very good money, and of course, uh, it was very attractive to him. That's how the investigation started. Uh, ultimately, uh, we set up a plan so we could, we could submit it to the Department of Justice so we could do an undercover operation targeting Man Singh and other members of the organization, uh, and that's how we got started. Do you worry, Polly, that you making public the details of this undercover investigation will give valuable information to smugglers? Well, there's no information in our book uh, that's not known, that's not a public record. Uh, you know, it's uh, things that smugglers already know. Uh, certainly, uh, they are always wary, maybe, of having undercover agents infiltrate their organizations. And, you know, I'm proud to say that uh, in, in my book, The Hunt for Man Singh, and my first book, The Shadow Catcher, uh, I detail a, a lot of those operations. Uh, they're ongoing. Uh, does it provide them a glimpse of how we operate? Probably so, but it's nothing that we're revealing that's a, that's a secret. So the operation itself was called Seek and Keep, and you posed as a Mexican smuggler um, offering to move people for Man Singh. How does that work? Do you 
actually go in and say, hi, I'm a smuggler. <laughs> I'd like to work with you. Well, actually, really, really, I'm not an agent. <laughs> well, the first thing we need to do, of course, you, you set up a, a scheme. You get approval from the Department of Justice to get it done. But before we even did that, of course, we had already infiltrated his organization through the use of a confidential informant that knew Munsing personally. Uh, he introduced me to Munsing in uh, Quito, Ecuador. I was the first U.S. agent that had ever uh, laid eyes on, on, on Munsing, the first agent that actually had spoken to Munsing. Uh, the information was already known as to his activities, but nobody had ever gotten to that particular point. You know, it, it was a risky uh, attempt because I had no backup in Quito, Ecuador. I was by myself. Uh, but we were ultimately successful in meeting with uh, Niranjan Mansing in Quito, Ecuador. And later on, one of his uh, protégés who became just as big as Mansing in the operation. Yeah, this is Nick Diaz. That's correct. That's not his real name. He's actually an Indian guy. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about him and what he was doing and how you were able to, to uh, catch him. Well, Nick Diaz, who was actually uh, Nitin Shetty, uh, was, uh, was based in the Bahamas and Ecuador. Uh, he, he decided that after being smuggled himself by members of the Munsing organization, saw that there was profits in uh, being made. He uh, loved the operation. He actually came to the United States, uh, was smuggled into Arizona and into California, ultimately went back into Quito, Ecuador, and became Munsing's biggest competitor. Uh, Nick was a, uh, a, uh, an excellent smuggler. He was uh, organized, a very bright uh, individual. He had actually started working as a human smuggler many years before being smuggled by Mansing when he actually uh, started getting uh, some, of his, uh, some of his clients on, uh, on ships, on uh, uh, Greek ships that he was able to uh, provide counterfeit documents uh, as seamen so they could get smuggled uh, to the United States. So how did you catch him? Well, Nick Diaz, we also had one of our informants infiltrate his organization. Um, he was very leery about meeting with me, but one of the things that was attractive that I told him that I was a Mexican rancher with an airplane that we could use for smuggling. Nick himself, by the way, had a couple of pilots that were uh, working for him in the Bahamas. He had people at the airport, uh, corrupt officials working with him uh, as well. Uh, and ultimately, that's the net that I had to infiltrate in the Bahamas. So on, one, on the one hand, I was dealing with Mansing, and on the other hand, I was dealing with Nick Diaz and telling both of them that I was dealing exclusively with them. So it was a little bit of a risky venture. And they actually did work with you. So they sent you clients, so to speak, to get smuggled into the United States, and you actually moved people. I did. I, uh, Mansing's clients would be transported on American Airlines. Uh, of course, we did the uh, proper vetting. Uh, we got the proper permission from the Department of Justice to make sure that we had no terrorists that were infiltrating uh, our country. Uh, and then we would meet them in Miami. As far as the Bahamas was concerned, uh, I would actually I w actually went to the Bahamas. I met with Nick Diaz. I met with his. Uh, uh, his coordinator, uh, an individual that we know as Gulu, that we mentioned in the hunt for Man Singh, uh, and we actually transported uh, numerous clients for Nick Diaz that we used as witnesses uh, against him when we uh, took the operation down. Was there at any point in this operation that you were actually in danger? Well, I think uh, there's always the danger of being recognized, and uh, I had already been an agent for more than 20 years. I had done many undercover operations uh, during that that period of time. Uh, we had an issue in the Bahamas when uh, an aer airport official attempted to stop our, our airplane from, uh, from taking off. Uh, when we took Nick Diaz down, we learned that the officials, the Bahamian officials that had been assigned to us, had actually been on his payroll as well. Uh, they had not learned my identity until the tail end. And when Nick Diaz was actually arrested, we had to be escorted out of the country because we received information that some of his thugs were actually going to the hotel where we were staying to, uh, to get kill you. at me at the, uh, and, and the agent that was my partner at the time. Okay, so first you have, to, um, you have to have evidence, you have to find the guy, but then you have to arrest him somehow and he's in a foreign country. So how does that work? Well, through our diplomatic mission, uh, we had meetings with the, uh, uh, with the top level officials uh, of the Bahamian government. Uh, we actually went to uh, an official who at one time was the Attorney General of the Bahamas, uh, and uh, she was very 
she was excellent in cooperating during our investigation, kept it very confidential, uh, and ultimately they uh, expelled uh, Nick Diaz. We transported Nick Diaz to Miami uh, on an airplane that I rented uh, to get him to the country. Uh, but the official, we, we cannot arrest somebody in a foreign country, so we have to engender the cooperation of the foreign officials, and we did. Uh, A.J. Irwin, my, my partner, who was a, an excellent uh, cool case agent with me on, the, on this case, uh, had been meeting with our diplomatic mission. Uh, we had an excellent uh, deputy chief of mi uh, mission, Pamela Bridgewater, uh, who represented us in uh, meetings with the Bahamian officials, and we were successful in getting him out of the country as we were in getting Mansing later on out of Venezuela. You um, talk in the book about all the bureaucracy and the infighting, the jealousies, um, one office trying to sabotage the whole operation. I mean, it's, this doesn't give the American public a lot of confidence in our immigration services. Well, I, I, I don't think it's just the immigration services. I think you find uh, in-house bickering in all agencies, whether it's DEA or the FBI, I'm sure that they've uh, gone through some of the same uh, uh, turmoil that we did during this operation. Uh, we have obstacles from within, uh, Mimi, that unfortunately arise. Uh, we had uh, agents that complained because they had not been allowed to participate in the case. We even had some agents that filed a discrimination complaint because they were uh, Anglo uh, agents that said they were not given the opportunity to to work on the case. Uh, which They're is like, not how come these Spanish-speaking guys get to do all the <laughs> work it, it, in Central America? Exactly, <laughs> and we actually had a, a very diversified group. Uh, but we had those type of abs uh, obstacles. We had a, uh, a an issue when I first presented the case uh, for approval from the, the undercover a review committee denied our uh, our application for uh, uh, for an operation, and we ultimately uh, appealed uh, the den the denial. Uh, that had never been done before, and we were successful in getting the Department of Justice to overturn their undercover review committee and allow us. Uh, and the undercover re review committee had uh, actually turned us down because they considered the case very risky, very dangerous for the people that we were uh, dealing with outside the country. Uh, and ultimately, we were able to get the get the approval that we needed. Where is Mansing now? Mansing, mm -hmm. uh, the last we heard, went back to England. And one of the good things about this case was that the purpose of an operation is to terminate the criminal activity. Mansing left human smuggling and went back to to England, and that we know of never went back into human smuggling. But other people have replaced him. So and I mean. What ultimately, what impact did we ultimately have with this operation? Well, I, I, it, it sends a strong message. Number one, uh, I've mentioned to you before in, in, in uh, one of the things that's important for me is that our security can never be compromised. And we have agents that work in day in and day out uh, trying to ensure the safety, the security of our country. And there, there is no doubt that uh, other organizations, just like in drug smuggling, are going to pop up. Uh, but we are just as committed in securing our borders and keeping our country safe. Uh, and it, it was back then, and it is now. In another undercover operation that you um, participated in, you posed as a migrant actually being smuggled. What was that experience like? The, uh, actually, I did it uh, many times. And uh, what was unique during my first operation that I actually crossed the river by myself uh, as I was being smuggled into the country, I almost drowned. Uh, and it was ironic, I was, uh, I was evading uh, detection uh, coming into my own country uh, and I almost, almost drowned the first time around on another, uh, on another occasion. I was actually in the back of a U-Haul with a number of migrants that had I not been uh, being smuggled, they probably would have died because the smuggler was going to abandon them in a uh, snowstorm in, in northern Texas. Uh, it, it, so it was challenging. Uh, it was uh, very different uh, in, in terms of being the first agent of the U.S. government to get smuggled from Mexico all the way to Chicago uh, in order to identify the main smugglers. But that became a trademark of my career, Mimi, that uh, I went after the big, biggest smugglers. I probably did more than 100 undercover operations throughout, uh, throughout my career. Uh, and and I'm, I'm glad to share that with the public. Uh, in, in my books, The Shadow Catcher and The Hunt for Man Singh, and, and my third book, which, will, by the way, will be released in March of next year. Let's talk about solutions. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the idea to build a wall between Mexico and the United States? 
Well, I think that the, uh, we should build the wall, but without having to construct the wall. Uh, and, and, and I think that's something that our leaders need to understand. Uh, number one is that uh, we have to find a solution by using commonsensical approaches to the immigration issue, which is complex, but we do have solutions. We, can, we should not build a wall, uh, per se, but we can construct a wall, we can, we can build a wall without constructing one by enforcing immigration law. We need to give it the attention uh, that it needs, and, and that's what, not what we're doing. Are you saying more enforcement along the border, so just more bodies? No, actually we had the, uh, in my view, we had the, uh, the, uh, the appropriate uh, agents along the border, but the negligence in our immigration system has been never having uh, an appropriate interior Im enforcement strategy or compliance. Uh, employers uh, are the magnet that attract people to come into the country, and for years and years uh, it's, uh, it's been neglected. Uh, our leaders have never made it an issue uh, of enforcing immigration law inside the United States. We have a large number of people that come into the country with visas that abuse their stay and, and don't leave. There's no strategy to go after those individuals. The audits that are done inside the United States uh, are minimal. Uh, and, and as a consequence, employers take a chance that they're not going to be audited and it's easier to make uh, large profits and, and not worry about uh, immigration enforcement. So once they're here, do you think they should be deported? There should be a more robust process of deporting people that are here, whether they've overstayed their visas or they've been smuggled in somehow? I think we should have been consistent because what has happened is that we were the magnet that brought these people into the country. Once they got smuggled and beyond the borders of the United States or they entered with visas, the likelihood of people being arrested and removed uh, were minimal. And that's the case now. Uh, we have, uh, you have to recall that in 2001, uh, it was estimated that we had about 3 million uh, undocumented aliens in the United States. Right now, it's estimated there's 10 to 15 million. Despite the fact that we went from 1,800 Border Patrol agents when I first joined the service to over 20,000 right now. So obviously that's not the solution. That's not the solution. Increasing border, border Patrol. That's correct. The, the, uh, I think that's a, uh, that's a right step in securing our border, but we need to have comprehensive immigration enforcement. Uh, I think that the, our political leaders both, from both parties uh, actually have used this as a political bouncing ball. Uh, over the years instead of being realistic and serious about doing the right thing. To your knowledge, and I know that you've, you've retired, but is the Border Patrol still going after these international smugglers that are outside the United States bringing people in? Well, uh, I, as a whole, you know, the uh, agencies were broken up. Now you have the Border Patrol became Customs and Border Protection. The investigations branch became uh, ICE, Immigration and, and Customs Enforcement. Uh, I, I think that they still do some. Uh, unfortunately, I think that the uh, when you when you have customs, they it became a lesser priority. To be honest with you, as far as immigration enforcement is concerned, there is a strategy. Of course, to, there's there are branches to go after some of these smugglers, but realistically, uh, you haven't heard of a single case like the one I did uh, in going after the after Mon Singh since uh, back in 1998. What's your family background, uh, Poli, and, and how did you get into Border Patrol? My, uh, my grandparents uh, were originally from Mexico. Uh, my, my parents were, were born in Texas. Uh, I grew up uh, along the uh, Texas-Mexico border. Uh, I, I didn't start speaking English until I was uh, six years old growing up on the border, but despite the fact that I was born in the United States. Uh, and uh, I joined the U.S. Navy when I was uh, 17. Spent four years uh, in the U.S. Navy, and uh, one year after I left the uh, military, I joined the U.S. Border Patrol. And how did you feel when you did that first undercover operation? It was it was rather unique. Uh, uh, I had never given it much thought, uh, and I think uh, as an American, I took things for granted in in the sense that uh, we we grew up in a sense that uh, we we have a great country, and uh, until you've been in the back of a U-Haul. Uh, or crossing the river where you almost drown, you realize what people go through to come into the country. Uh, I'm not saying it's, a, it's the right thing, but I saw uh, the desire of people to come into the country. And I, I remember a 16-year-old uh, a kid when I was in Mexico, uh, we were in, a, in one room, there was 22 of us, and 
uh, I asked him, why do, you, why do you want to come to the United States? And he said, one of the things that I want to do is uh, I want to join the military. Uh, and uh, when the I American get, military, the American military, well, uh, when I get to the United States, because I, I want to serve in the military and I want to be part of the United States. Uh, and I think there's still a lot of that feeling, despite the fact that uh, a lot of things have changed. But uh, you know, uh, uh, the United States is still the greatest country in the world. As you look back, uh, Paulie, on your very long years of service in in this field, what are you most proud of? Well, I, I. Uh, I believe that we were doing the right thing in enforcing the law that way it was supposed to be enforced, and I also believe that uh, uh, our nation is still a welcoming nation, uh, and you know there's we welcome people from throughout the world, uh, and and we we try to do things right, uh, and and uh, and I'm very proud of the fact that uh, you know I I still believe that we're the greatest country. I I believe that too, but we clearly have to to work on our immigration problem because that's not going away. <laughs> I think that the, uh, our, our political leaders need to do what's right for the country, not what's right for them. Uh, and if they, if they pursue that goal, we can find the solutions and we can do the right thing. Uh, it, it's just a matter of making that particular decision. Well, Paulie, thanks so much for being on the program. I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure. This has been the Mimi Gargas Show. You can see all of our programs on YouTube and WHUT.org. Connect with us on Facebook and Twitter and leave me your comments there. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join me again next time.